And I ain't worried about him. I'm just afraid he'll fall on Miss Pat. <laughs> we ain't got but one Miss Pat. We can replace them lead guitar players a dime a dozen. We just can't replace Miss Pat. I know y'all wouldn't believe it, but boy, he's stubborn. <laughs> Thank you for the uh, congregational singing and the uh, special music this morning. If you will, open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 22 and 23. Uh, we're going to be dealing with the fruit of the Spirit and uh, trying to think along the lines and trying to uh, get into the mind of uh, Jesus if he were to walk in and... Uh, do some fruit inspection this morning in our personal lives. What would he be looking for uh, in our personal lives if he was uh, looking for fruit? And uh, I did quite a bit of research that I won't be sharing a lot of that with you this morning, but you know, Jesus did use the term fruit quite a bit in his uh, terminology. Uh, he uh, said that a man would... Uh, be recognized by the fruit that he produced, whether it was good or whether it was bad. Uh, you'd be able to recognize uh, a person and uh, be able to identify a tree by its fruit or a vine by its fruit. And uh, so Jesus was uh, pretty much in tune with uh, the things uh, of the fruit in uh, the scripture. So, uh, when we think about that and we think about the life of Jesus, uh, when we think about the fruit of the Spirit, I just want to spend a little time uh, this morning. We're going to kind of backtrack just a little bit because we talked a little bit about love, but I want to spend just a little bit uh, more time on that because I really don't think that we can overemphasize how important uh, love is because uh, if there was an ultimate sacrifice and the man that did the ultimate sacrifice is the man named Jesus Christ and uh, to talk about his love and how he emphasized it over and over and over and over again and how he wanted his people uh, to uh, be a people of love uh, with no partiality being shown among his people uh, it was Jesus and how he went over that over and over and over again. If you can comfortably stand, uh, we're going to read Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Uh, he said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to prepare your heart for his word this morning. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence this morning, and Father, we bow humbly before you because we've got a book open that's very sacred, very precious, God-written, God-breathed. I know the writer of the book of Galatians was Paul as he was writing to the church at uh, Galatea. And uh, God, we just ask you, Father, for an anointing of your Holy Spirit. Ask you, Father, to speak to us through your word. God, we ask for an anointing. We ask for you to speak. God, to move among us. Father, to uh, God, to reach into the places that uh, maybe we really didn't come here prepared for you to get into that place, uh, to get into that uh, spot into our heart. But I pray that you would move and uh, God do things that we didn't expect you to do. God, I pray for the reading of your divine word because it was breathed, <coughs> spoken to uh, Paul as he was writing to the church there at uh, Galatians. And uh, God, you were dealing with the uh, issues and uh, just wanting, realizing that uh, the flesh and the spirit were going to be fighting wars. And uh, you knew that in order for 
the spirit to uh, win the battle, that there was going to be a decision made among the Christian people there at the church at Galatians, as well as there will be a decision made right here among the people at Copper Springs Baptist Church this morning as to the decision that will be made as to whether we will let the spirit win or whether we'll give in to the flesh today. So I pray that we will win that battle because we have all of the resources by the power of the Holy Spirit of God because it was birthed into us when we were born again. It was given to us by the authority of God. It was placed into the individual as a child of God when they were born again. So I pray that we'd use that resource if there's things in our life that needs to be removed. I pray that we would circle those things right now and that we'd begin to be uh, do a work with the power of the Holy Spirit invested in us, uh, that Jesus in us has given us that authority to remove those things, to conquer those things, and that we would identify them right now, that we would not uh, sweep them under the rug and uh, act like that we don't have anything that needs to be removed, but we would uh, circle those things, identify them under the power of the Holy Spirit, and uh, begin to work upon those things under your presence, under your authority, and remove those things. Take this moment, take this time, let it be used for your honor, for your glory, to uh, make us more in the uh, 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 identification of you, the way you think, the way you see things, uh, that we might uh, be a stronger church body and for this community and that lost souls might be born into the kingdom of God. For someone here today that don't know you, Holy Spirit, would you draw upon their hearts? Would you draw them to a saving knowledge of you? Would you help them to identify the love that you had for them on the cross and help them, Father, to know that you love them so much? And I pray that this would be the service that they'd come to acknowledge you as their Lord and Savior and confess their sin to you. In Jesus' precious holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we we'll go back to uh, verse 22. I want to look at the word fruit uh, again for just a moment. And I want you to notice that it says it's a fruit of the Spirit. And uh, that cannot be overemphasized. Uh, because when you look up the word fruit uh, in the original Greek, uh, it's a word that is spelled out K-A-R-P-O-S uh, in the Greek. And if you really get it into a word study, it says that it's a true partnership with Jesus Christ. And I don't think anybody would deny that. If we go back to uh, John chapter 15, and I'm not going to go over there right now. We may uh, a little bit later. Uh, but right as he talked about that, he said, I'm the vine and you're the branch. So that's a true partnership. There's nothing that can be grown out of anything. And he even said that emphatically, without me, you can do nothing. That's some direct quote out of uh, John chapter 15. So Jesus is saying that there will be no fruit production without Jesus Christ, without the Holy Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit, we need to understand, is a true partnership. And when we look at that, that Greek word continues to define itself with a divine, divine nature of Christ. It's not something that you and I can produce. It's not something that I can get genetically through Lawrence and Clara Burden when they produce Gary Burden. It's not a genetic nature that I can get from Lawrence and Clara Burden. It's not something that you can get. I don't care how good a moral mom and dad that you have, the fruit of the Spirit cannot be brought through your mom and dad. You can go to church all of your life. You can sit in the pews all of your life. You can read the Bible through once a year, every year for 75 years, 
and you cannot come up with the fruit of the Spirit. It comes through a born-again experience by knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. By grace are you saved through faith. That is the only way that you can have the fruit of the Spirit. It comes through a divine nature. You cannot possess it any other way. And after you have possessed that divine nature, for some reason we have lost this in this 21st generation. We have actually lost it before the 21st generation, but we have really lost it in the 21st generation. <laughs> For some reason, people believe that there's a born-again experience without any characteristic changes in the world that we live in today. That you can go up, you can shake the preacher's hand, you can have a born-again experience, you can find a baptistry or you can find a creek somewhere and you can be baptized and you can become a member of a church and you have that divine nature but you live the same lifestyle and you have a ticket to heaven and everybody's going to heaven and everybody's going to be happy and glad and everybody's going to be rejoicing in heaven uh, and heaven's just going to be full of merry people uh, they shook their, the preacher's hand, said a prayer, and went on their merry way, and there was no characteristic change. But I want to tell you something. Uh, when you have a born-again experience, there's a divine nature called the Holy Spirit uh, that came into your life that is going to produce by nature, and this goes on to re refer this same word, K-A-R-P-O-S, Translated fruit refers to a natural product of a living thing. Now get that. It's a natural product of a living thing. It's not something that we have to go out here and just work on. And I'll read you some scripture here in just a minute. But it, it's something that we really have to we have to to look at. I'm gonna skip down. Uh, if you can, bring up Galatians 5, 16 through 18 for just a minute, Jamie. Uh, I want us to look at uh, starting with verse 16. He said, what happens in this walk of life? We have become lazy Christians. Uh, we don't want to put forth any effort. Uh, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm as lazy as you are. I don't eat at Sonic. You know why? I don't want to push a button. No. I can go to McDonald's or I can go to Burger King and when I pull up for some reason they know I'm there. I don't have to push a button to tell them that, that I'm there. Uh, so they know I'm there and I just tell them what I want. If I go to Sonic, I have to roll my window down and push a button. So I don't go to Sonic. I just go to McDonald's or I go to Burger King and they know I'm there. We're lazy today. I want to tell you something. Satan is not lazy. Uh, Satan works hard every day, day in and day out, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Look at verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let me just read something into that and I don't think I'm taking anything away from the verse and I'm not adding anything into the verse. If you do not walk in the Spirit, you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. Did I read anything into that verse? Uh, I don't think so. If you do not walk in the Spirit, Satan is going to see that you fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, you're going to go along with the flow of the world. Uh, you're going to do the things that he wants you to do. Let's look at verse 17 now. Uh, because he said the, love, the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another that you do not do the things that you wish. Does anybody have that problem besides your pastor? 
Does anybody have a warfare going on every day that Satan tries to get you to do something that you know that you don't need to be doing? That he tries to get you to say something? That he tries to get you to do something? That he tries to get you to, to do? That he tries to get you to lose your temper? That he tries to get you to do things? Is everybody just so godly that Satan's scared of you and that he just runs off and he never tempts you to do anything? I don't believe that there's anybody here, if you're a born-again believer, Satan's after you today. Because that Bible verse right there proves it. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. What's he saying? He's saying there's a war going on if you're a born-again spirit. If you've got the spirit of God, the spirit's lusting against the, the spirit's warring against the flesh and the flesh is warring against the spirit and there's a battle going on now. And he said, these are contrary one to another so that you do not do the things that you wish you do. Sometimes I, I slip up, I don't do the thing. I sit down and I look back and I say, man, I was going to study my Bible more this week. I was going to pray this week more. I was going to quit running up and down the roads more this week. And I was going to do more of these things that I said I was going to do. And guess what? Uh, he got me in that same spider web uh, that he had me in last week, and I studied just as much this week as I did last week, and last week was the same week as the week before, and I just get all wrapped up in all of that kind of stuff uh, and the same thing, and I'm practicing insanity. I'm doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Uh, but what, let's look at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And you could actually put flesh in there. If you're led by the Spirit. See, there's a difference there when you're saying led by the Spirit and walk by the Spirit. <coughs> How many of you sit down, and after I've studied this this week... Has anybody got a fault that you know in your life that you really need to work on? Well, we don't like to admit it, but i got one. Mona Jean T, I've got more than one, but uh, have we not all got something that we need to work on? But how many times do we circle them in our lives and get up and say, God, I want to work on this. And I know, God, that I need the divine power of your grace to conquer this. Amen. But I'm not giving up on it because I have victory through you. And I'm going to work on it today. I'm not giving in to it. And if I fail sometime during the day, I'm going to confess to you that I failed and I'm going to pull my bootstraps up and I'm going to fight again against it. But we, we, we are like I am with Sonic. We're not going to put forth that effort on it. We just want to glide along. Well, I do most of the stuff right. Do you think God's okay with that, that we just do most of the stuff right? Do you think the Holy Spirit that come from God down through Jesus Christ and implanted the Holy Spirit in us is okay that we just do most of the stuff right, but we're not going to fight against the flesh to purify our lives and for Him to sanctify our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, but we're going to fight that battle for Him I wonder what he would have thought about that when he was going up the, the hill to Golgotha and couldn't even carry the cross because he had had himself beat half to death because of your sin and because of my sin. That's right. The fruit of the Spirit. What kind of fruit is Jesus looking for? If Jesus came in this building today, what kind of fruit would Jesus be looking for? Is he looking for church attendance? Is he looking for how many times we got put on Facebook? Looking for how much family time we spend? What's he looking for? 
Well, according to this, these characters, it says fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit. But the first one that he named was love. Am I right? And when we look at that word love, there's four main different ones. Some says that there's four, I mean, up to six different ones in the scripture. I'm going to just read you four real quick, and I'm going to go through them really, really quick. E-R-O-S is a physical love, a romantic love. The phylos is a close friendship love. The S-T-O-R-G-E is a family relationship love. But the, the one that is here in your Bible, that he said the fruit of the Spirit and the first one that he named is love, is agape. Amen. So if he's saying that we're connected and we have the Spirit and we're going to produce not anything of our own. It's a divine character that comes through us through the Holy Spirit. He is saying that I put an agape love in you. Agape means that it's a love which only, it's a divine love. It seeks the highest good of others. It's non-partial and it's sacrificial. Boy, non-partial knocked a lot of people out, didn't it? Because you can, you can look around and see, when we think about non-partial, we can look around and see that it's very difficult to be non-partial, ain't it? Because you can look around and even in our community, when someone dies and you start to take food to the house, you have to consider who that person is that died. Because if it's a certain person, you say, well, you really don't need to buy that much food to take over there because they're going to have oodles and gobs of food. If it's another person, you better pitch in a little extra because they're probably not going to have very much food. Is that non-partial? That's not agape love. Agape love is non-partial. Says I'll do for you and I'll do for you and I'll do for you and I'll do for you. Don't matter to me who it is. And sacrificial We'll find out about sacrificial love here. Well, let's just go ahead and read it. Can you bring up 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16? We all know John 3, 16, don't we? Everybody can quote that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Everybody can quote that verse. Have you ever looked at 1 John 3, 16? Let's look at it for just a minute. By this, we know love because he laid down his life for us. Well, we should have just stopped right there. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And that word ought don't mean that I'm giving you a choice. If you want to, go ahead. But if you don't want to, I'm okay with that. That's not what that verse means at all. That's a commandment. I'm not giving you a choice. If you're going to have agape love, you will lay down your life for your brethren. Amen. That's agape love. But let's go back and see what Jesus in John chapter 13 Verse 34 and 35. 
This is Jesus. He's still in the upper room where we're talking about back in chapter 15. Jesus is still in the upper room giving his final discourse right before he washes the disciples' feet. Right before he tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. He said, a new commandment I give to you. Now that new commandment is real, a little confusing to me. I really don't know what, but I think he's trying to get them to understand the depth of love that he has for mankind. And he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. They put a comma or a semicolon there. And then the next phrase, as I have loved you. Now at this particular time, Jesus has not died on the cross. But Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus had walked with his disciples. He had cared for his disciples. I can't remember exactly whether he had already washed their feet or whether he was about to wash their feet. He had put up with a lot of nonsense with his disciples. He had shown them some deep, deep love. But look at verse 35. He says in verse 35, by this, what is by this? The love that they have for one another. What is destroying the power of God today in the churches today. The lack of love. I think it was, I think it was Jimmy, I may be wrong, in our Wednesday night Bible study just a few weeks ago that mentioned, we were studying in Ephesians and it was talking about And I'm paraphrasing, but I can go back and find you the verse real quick. That if you can't build somebody up, say something good. Your words be seasoned with grace towards somebody. Don't say it. But we got this attitude that what I said is the truth. I saw it for myself. So it's okay to be said, right? That's not what the Bible says. Do you think Jesus might have had something to say? Do you think that when Peter walked out on the water, that he could have went back to town and told them what idiots those other 11 were? They didn't have enough faith to step out. I only had one out of 12. I've spent three years with them idiots. Would that not have been the truth? But only one of them had enough faith to step out. And after he stepped out, he fell and sunk. That would have been the truth, wouldn't it? But did Jesus do that? But no, we want to get that tongue wound up, don't we? We want to tell somebody. We want to be the first to tell somebody. That's not the kind of love that Jesus was talking about with agape love. What would happen right here at Copper Springs Baptist Church is if over at Thunderbird, they never heard anything except something good about your pastor and everyone else in this church building. 
when they went to Randy Duncan's store of business and they went to Richie Battle's store of business, they never heard anything except something good. And if they started to hear something bad, they'd say, wait a minute. If you're not going to say anything good, would you just please hold that conversation for somewhere else? Say, so that ain't going to happen. We're in Guy, Arkansas. I agree. It's not Guy, Arkansas. It's Damascus, Arkansas, and Quitman, Arkansas, and everywhere else. And Jesus is sitting up there saying, I bled and died with my love and gave it all for you. And all we want to do is cut each other's throats and call ourselves Christians, call ourselves fellow church members. And the first two words, by this, all, A-L-L, -L, all guy community, all Conway, all Faulkner County, they will know. But they're probably not going to know that you're Jesus' disciples. They will if you have one love one for another, and that love is the agape love. It's not the cheap love that I love you. I talk good to certain people about you, but ones that I can hide it behind Jesus gave it all. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. I didn't get through half what I was going to get through. Sorry about that, Jamie. I know you put a bunch of scriptures together. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Don't do it because Gary Burton stood up there and screamed and hollered about it today. Because it's of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Both of those, three of those loves, love one another, love is of God, loves is born of God, that's all I got back. Hadn't we watered down so much of what God really is? God's love was son, Go die so that I can have a relationship with Sammy Duncan, Donna Duncan, Miss Helen, Caleb, Megan, everybody else in this building. You know what he did? Coming up 25th of December, we're celebrating when he come through the Virgin Mary and hit the earth. Spent 33 years down here. Took one of the worst beatings that the history of mankind has ever known. Was placed on an old rugged cross and brutally beaten with nails driven through his hands and his feet. <clears throat> Crown of thorns on his head. Stripped naked. Beat with whips so that you could have a relationship with God. That's love. That's love. Then we won't run around and say we have love. Somebody says something hurts our feelings, I'm done with you. Somebody does something that we don't like, I'm done with you. Is that love? You know what it, who it hurts? Well, I just spoke the truth. I just said what was on my mind. Really? 
Are you born of God? Have you got God's love? You know what the tongue can do? James said it can set a forest on fire that you can't put out. Let's show the love of God. By this, they will know that you're my disciple.